All right. Welcome back, everybody. We will now listen to Marco Kepi telling us something about managing world uh, workloads at scale in the cloud or on bare metal with Yulu. Enjoy. Thank you. Uh, so that's essentially what my talk will be about. But I, when I submitted it, it was quite long, and it's a very long title. So if you're wondering even what this is about based on that title, essentially what I'll be talking about is democratizing data center in the cloud using a set of tools that are provided by um, Canonical and Ubuntu. So I, I'm Marco Cepi. I work for Canonical. Uh, Canonical is the company behind Ubuntu. Um, in addition to helping support Ubuntu commercially, they also build an additional set of suites uh, of tools that are open source that allow you to help manage what you may be doing in Ubuntu or otherwise um, very easily. So what I want to talk about real briefly is what this is and why it's on the stage and, and how it ties into the rest of this talk. Uh, so if you haven't seen this, uh, this is our, we call it the orange box. It's basically how we go from customer sites and conferences and demonstrate our tools on bare metal. Uh, it is, for all intents and purposes, a very scaled down data center. Uh, it has uh, networking going in, it has uh, power management internally, and it has 10 Intel NUCs inside of it that model what a physical server would be. It's got disk, dedicated, NICs, uh, all that jazz that you'd normally find in hardware, just scaled down and something that I can drag onto an airplane and take with me. Uh, so throughout the talk, I'll be referring to and showing actual live demos of the tools running, and it's all everything running against this box here. Um, so this is what this is. This is why it's here. This is what it's doing, whirling in the background, making noise. Um, so I want to talk briefly about some of the problems that we've been trying to solve in inside of Canonical and for customers at Canonical and people in inside, the, inside the ops world in general. And they basically distilled down to these kind of three key things that we've seen recently is how do I manage physical and virtual resources, things like servers, network switches, uh, SAN disk arrays. Uh, how do I deploy services to these resources? And then how do I scale these services so that I can respond appropriately? Uh, so what we've done at Canonical and what we've been providing uh, as open source tools to everyone to use is a set of tools that we'd, I like to demonstrate with you guys today and talk through what they are, how they could potentially be used. Uh, so the first up is Maz, which is Metal as a Service. Um, Maz is essentially an API for your data center, if you want to think of it that way. Um, it allows you to do things like um, declare resources that you have. It allows you to uh, allocate those resources to a, a, a set of people. It allows you to deploy and provision an operating system on top of those resources, or however it would be to actually bootstrap that process. And then it allows you to return them back to the general pool of use and then recommission them over again. So it allows you to do things that you would normally do in the cloud, stand up resources, put stuff onto those resources, reap those resources later on with actual bare metal. Um, so this includes things like uh, managing DNS, IP address management, D, uh, uh, DHCP, uh, everything else. And it's all available through a very robust API that anything um, from a command line user to an actual application could hook into. Um, and excitingly enough, uh, in addition to some of the tools I'll show you guys today, Chef actually recently released a provisioning layer for Maz. So if you have Chef scripts that you want to just push straight out to bare metal, you can actually use Chef and Maz to do that right now. And I, envi I imagine other such services uh, and configuration management tools will be doing something similar as well. Um, so I'm going to briefly show you Maz, um, how the machines are modeled in this box, how an admin can take actions against them, and then kind of bleed into what you may want to do once you have your physical resources declared in your, in your data center environment. So this is what MAS looks like running on this orange box here. Uh, we have a couple of virtual machines that we've set up for lightweight embodiments. And then we also have the uh, management of the nine additional nodes in here, nodes one through nine. Um, unfortunately, traveling with these boxes, especially through American TSA, is a bit rough. I've actually broken several nodes on the way here. Um, I've marked them as broken in my GUI. You can see the lights are on, but no one's really home on that node right now. Mass can't talk to it. So from an admin perspective, it was nice to be able to say, well, I know these nodes are not responding. Mark them as broken. Mass knows how to handle that appropriately. Um, adding new resources is pretty easy. You can add resources or entire class of machines, chassis like Moonshot chassis or uh, Microsoft's new open hardware chassis. Um, you essentially just declare the machine at a very high level and then things like how do I power this machine on? And we can do a whole slew of machine p power management and this is all plug -in -able. So uh, with a few lines of Python, you can actually wrap how to communicate with other um, power types that aren't modeled here. So things like IPMI, um, 
ILO 4 for HP Moonshot, Intel AMT for talking to NUX, uh, the C micro chassis, uh, VMware ESXi, uh, vSphere, uh, Versh itself, if you have a bunch of virtual machines, you can manage those with Versh through KVM, and also the rudimentary wake on LAN, which isn't the best power management tool because there's no way to do the end life cycle of how do I turn off the wake on LAN, but that's available as well if that's what you have to model. Um, so this is essentially what MAS looks like. Provisioning is very straightforward. MAS is an agnostic tool for operating system to be deployed against it. So with MAS, you can actually stand up and deploy Ubuntu workloads uh, as an operating system level. You can also deploy CentOS as a base operating system. You can also deploy Windows. And we can deploy Windows from zero to a Windows machine running in less than 15 minutes with only one reboot cycle using MAS. Uh, so if you're, if you're a Windows admin and you have to deal with that pain every day of going through update cycles for um, Microsoft's 2012 uh, HVR2 or whatever is the latest server release, and that's a very long process. MAS is a way that we can help to make that process much easier for you. Um, so MAS also has ideas of how do you scale. So right now it's on 10 machines in this little, well, I guess you would be embodied by a rack, but how do you scale up with MAS? MAS will actually allow you to distill knowledge about uh, zones, clusters, and whole regions. So you can model multiple data centers in MAS and have the drive throughout the, the drill through for that being managed with MAS. So you can say this resource is in this cluster, which is part of this zone, which is essentially in this data center. So the tiered effect and the rolled up effect is all something you can model uh, within MAS. Um, as well as networking. So if you have specific VLANs, if you have things like um, any kind of software defined networking, bonding interfaces that you want to make MAS aware of, you can do that also through MAS with the with the network's interface. So it really gives you the way to just describe at a very base level, this is what I have for hardware. Um, it has mechanisms to do auto-enlistment, so if it sees something come online in the network, it'll try to enlist and figure out what it is. It also captures resource statistics, uh, machine characteristics, how much RAM, how much disk, what disks, what network interfaces do I have, uh, how many cores of CPU do I have, the kind of things that you may want to know as you spin up stuff through the API. And this allows you to, through the API, say, Maz, I request a machine with at least this much RAM, and it'll find the next best match for you and give it to you. And then you can do things like taxonomy on top of that to say these are a group of machines I wish to declare by an arbitrary tag. And you can search and find and launch machines through there. Uh, so this is Maz. It's, I mean, it's pretty cool if you've ever had to work with data center level hardware. It's kind of hard to manage all that enlistment stuff without getting really tucked into uh, some kind of bigger vendors, tools. Um, so this is a very lightweight. It can be dropped into a data center. It can be easily removed from a data center. There's really no... Um, no real binding factor once you have MAS in there. You pull MAS out, all the machines that were running are running, all the machines that were off are off, and there's really nothing. If you want to go back to using straight I, uh, IPMI to power those machines on, you can, MAS will let you do that. So it is a, it is a bit of a drop-in replacement for things like that. Um, why I want to talk about MAS and why I think MAS is so important. I hope it starts from there. Yes, it does. Um, is because we have a growing complexity issue with data centers. And, and with general machine deployment, whether it's cloud or whether it's bare metal hardware, is from a story perspective, we started a long time ago with mainframes. We moved on. We had servers, and then people grew servers into racks. Racks eventually grew in complexity and became data centers. And so people are managing large-scale hardware, um, and they're using tools that were designed for really single, um, single hardware management. And on top of that, we have additional complexity through now virtualization, where we're now virtualizing our physical hardware, either through containers or through virtual machines. And this adds to a growing list of tools that are required to manage this. MAS takes care of that whole abstraction for you. It's not the main presentation I want to show you, but I want to explain what MAS was, because in, especially in an open source data center world, MAS becomes a very key player for helping manage those resources um, throughout time and as you add and grow and scale your infrastructure. So, what this leads to is, is something interesting. And so we've, we've gone through the cycle of single machine, we have multiple machines, now we have VMs. And as a result of all that cycle, tools are being built around that. And the whole ecosystem is being curated, and that's machine management. And that's things like uh, Chef and Puppet, Ansible, Docker and Rocket, SaltStack, all these tools that say, I have a definition of what I know the machine should look like. Let me execute that definition against my machine. That way I have a repeatable way to reproduce these resources. And this is configuration management, but for the sake of this conversation, I'm going to say it's really machine level management because we're defining what a machine looks like and we're setting up that machine every time. And even at, a, even at the largest of scales, that's time consuming and complex because I have to define what this machine is, apply the resources 
the, in this case, whatever machine management tool I'm using to that machine, and then I have to add additional configuration to declare how that machine plays in the larger scale world of, of my, my software stack, of my deployment of, of what I'm managing. Um, so this is where Juju comes into play. This is where I'm going to spend most of my talk talking about. Um, Juju is a service orchestration tool. Um, next generation is probably a little too buzzy sounding. It's really just a service orchestration tool. Uh, and so what Juju does is it allows you to stop thinking so much about the machine and more about the service, how that service looks, how to define how that service is deployed, how that service scales. And the most important piece of Juju, the thing that really matters the most, is how that service connects with other services in my environment. And that's what we're really, service orchestration is a big term. When we talk about service orchestration from Juju, we say, how do I manage the core tenets of deploying, scaling, and connecting a service um, inside of my deployed environment? So the reason I talked about MAS is because MAS lets you model hardware through an API. Juju lets you model services, and all of these things that we've been talking about are all really just simple abstractions from even an operating system, which is really just a set of APIs for hardware. Virtual machines are really just a constrained API for how to talk to that hypervisor. Um, machine management, things like Chef and Puppet and those guys are really abstractions on how do I talk to different operating system layers. Uh, so Juju becomes an abstraction for how do I talk orchestration in my environment? What does that model look like? What's that topology look like? So, Juju itself is the ability to speak with many different providers and provisioners, uh, MAS being one of them, so you can orchestrate on top of bare metal the same way you orchestrate on top of a cloud environment, Amazon, DigitalOcean, Google Compute Engine, Joint, OpenStack, any of those guys as well. The same services that you write for those, just like when you write a Chef, a chef script or, a, or an Ansible script, all of those work against the operating systems that Chef works against, which is essentially all the ones you may want to be deploying machines on top of. Juju does the same thing for cloud level abstractions. So if I want to say deploy something on the bare metal, deploy something on the cloud, instead of having to define what that is for two separate processes, Juju allows me to say just one time, deploy this, deploy this, and it handles that abstraction layer for you. Um, and Juju does all this through charms. So charms are essentially these little units of what a service definition looks like. Uh, and it's embodied in code. And it's really the operational component of, of that code. So it's not really necessarily the software project. It's not actually the code for what Hadoop looks like in this case, which is Hadoop uh, connected to HDFS, Hive, and then MySQL. If anyone's doing any big data stuff, this may seem familiar. But this is a very simple, very, very simple um, Hadoop big data stack. So what Juju Charms do is allows you to encapsulate the knowledge that it takes to deploy Hadoop, to scale Hadoop, and to connect Hadoop to other services. And why this matters is because when you do something in this fashion where you're doing connections, um, it gives you the ability to democratize which components you use at which time and which stage. So charms themselves, just like Juju being language agnostic and Maz being OS agnostic, uh, charms themselves are also language agnostic. They're really just a wrapper around how you do a machine level setup and then how that machine speaks to other services in the ecosystem. So it's really just the translation layer between, well, whenever this event triggers, um, and Juju itself is an event distributed network, uh, event distributed tool, so as events are being processed in real time in a live environment, it's dispatching events which then incur invocations of code that are encapsulated in charms. That was way too much talking for that portion. But basically, is we're doing event dispatching at the, at the highest level. Um, you declare to Juju what you want your environment to look like. Juju takes that set of instructions and rectifies it against what's currently in the environment and then dispatches events to make that happen. And it's this really event framework that allows people to model complex deployments in ways they may have never been able to before. Um, so charms themselves are language agnostics. Uh, you can write a charm using Python or Ruby or PowerShell even if you were deploying Windows workloads. Uh, you can also wrap a bunch of existing machine provider tools because what these guys do very well is set up a machine definition. How should this machine look from bare, from bare operating system to a service running? What Juju aims to provide is the ability to say once this machine is set up, what's its larger role with everything else that's going on in the environment. How does it connect to other units that are running in its service group? What happens when I have more than two units of MySQL? All of that logic is encapsulated, then what happens when MySQLs connect to Hive? All of that language is then encapsulated as 
uh, these scripts, which we call hooks, which are just responses to events that Juju is signaling in the environment. Um, so in addition to being language agnostic, Charms are also, and Juju is also, platform agnostic. So Juju can deploy Ubuntu and Windows workloads. CentOS workload support just landed a few weeks ago. Um, and we'll be adding more support for other operating systems as we go on. And we also have support for architecture independence. So x86, ARM, Power8, anything else that um, Ubuntu and Windows and CentOS and other workloads we support, whatever operating systems those guys will run on, we will also support in Charms and Juju implicitly. So you can model, what gets interesting here is you can model things like, well, I have Active Directory or MS SQL, something that we've been maintaining for quite a long time. You can deploy that with Juju and connect to things that are running in CentOS or Ubuntu or other operating systems. Juju doesn't care what the underlying provisioning is doing. It just cares the layer of orchestration, how these services communicate and react to changes in the events in the environment. And what we see this going and where we see really technology heading is that really modern deployments and architectures will be service-centric. They will be more about the service and less about the machine. We're moving away from, we don't care about the hardware you're using, we care about the operating system you're using. And we're moving even further away from that. We don't care about the operating system you're using, we care more about the workload you're deploying. And going even further, we're saying, we don't really care about anything on the bottom of the stack, we just care about the services deployed and scaled the best way possible. Now, of course, saying that we don't care about that is a pretty ignorant view on things. People do actually care about what's happening on the under layers there. But for the most part, what we see people going is we're saying, well, I just need this service. And we find experts that say, this is how I deploy this service as an example for you. And you can use that, or you can take it and modify it. Our charms are all open source, along with the other suite of tools we've shown you. So we give you a, a basically what we call is the executable white paper. Experts are encapsulating their knowledge on how to deploy, scale, and manage connections between environments and users um, inside of charms. And that, that is essentially what would have been a white paper, where you can deploy, execute it, scale it, see how it responds to these events and triggers in the environment and then you can connect and move forward from there, or fork and modify to suit your needs. Um, so we really call this peer-to-peer -peer orchestration, which is what Juju's doing. Um, so in the previous example, we've condensed down a little bit, Hadoop, Hive, and MySQL. Um, what an operator has done is they've said, deploy Hadoop, deploy Hive, and deploy MySQL, and then connect MySQL to Hive, Hive to Hadoop. What the operator said is, here's what I want you to do, go make that happen. So what Juju does on the back side is it, it pushes events out to all these services. I need machines for these services that are brand new. It brings them up and installs the code base for the charm on there. Then going forward, it says MySQL and Hive need to now be able to communicate with each other. Uh, MySQL and Hive, as charms declared, these are the protocols that I speak, and these are the protocols I can speak on. Uh, so Hive has a way to speak with MySQL. It, it understands each other. And when you make that connection, a set of a series of events higher fire on each of those machines, that then does what's required in order to Hive to speak to MySQL. So in this case, MySQL will create a database schema, a user and a password attached to that schema, and then submit it directly to Hive, which would trigger an event saying, you now have additional data, here's your data, and then Hive can configure itself to use MySQL as a pool. From an operator, I don't have to know what the credentials are. I can find them out, but I don't have to know what they are. I don't have to manually edit configuration files. All of that's managed for me on the lower level as a charm. Um, same with Hadoop Hive configure, uh, communication. Hive has all the credentials it needs to speak to Hadoop in order to create a query language that it uses MySQL as a backend for. What gets interesting is that services provide similar and, and like interfaces. So with MySQL, uh, there's also MariaDB. And so because these are composable units of service definitions, we can easily swap out MySQL for MariaDB. Maybe one's more performant for you. Maybe you have commercial support through one or the other. Or maybe you just want to try out a new technology. Since MariaDB says it speaks the same protocol as MySQL, these can be easily switched out, and MariaDB will present the same information that needs in order for Hive to connect to a MySQL database. And the same can be said about Percona cluster. If you want to use Percona rather than using any of the previous mentioned ones, you can deploy Percona instead, attach it to Hive, and you get the same interface. For the charm, it doesn't know what the service is connected to. It only knows that it has the ability to speak the MySQL protocol. And that's all that matters from a service definition standpoint. Going one step further, we also gain repeatable patterns with, with, um, with Juju. So this may be a little hard to see, but this is just a very, rather complicated, but a, an application that's deployed using Rails, where we have HAProxy connected to Rails, connected to Redis, Memcache, Postgres, a monitoring using Nagios, and then log aggregation using Logstash, Elasticsearch, and Kibana, the Elk stack. 
since all these pieces are composable and independent of each other, when you deploy things like NRP and Nagios, it's the same NRP and Nagios that anyone else is deploying that service is using. And as they improve it, you gain those improvements as well. The general open source philosophy. But it, that same component can be applied to any one other component inside of your deployment, whether it's Rails, suddenly monitoring Postgres, Memcache, uh, whatever you have. And what you get with Juju is when you told Juju the pattern that you want to use, the topology you wish to execute in the environment, it will allow you to download that and repeat that topology anywhere. So what you can do is you can have a deployment that you use in production that you can capture and give to developers. They can run it use locally using Lexi containers in Juju, so they can repeat that same setup that you've done in production locally. Dev, rev, commit, push. That same declaration can be used in QA. Set up the same thing you have in production in QA, dev, rev, um, test, and then you can reapply that to production. So Juju gives you the ability to repeat these patterns in a reliable and sane fashion um, from any scale down. So do some quick demonstrations of Juju. Um, I've got this orange box here. I'm going to, uh, has anyone ever, is anyone managing OpenStack, deploying OpenStack, doing anything with OpenStack? No? Okay. It's pretty complex. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm very weary to demo it because there's a lot of stuff that goes on. So I have this deploy script here, and what it's doing is it's executing this bundle that I have. And a bundle is just a uh, YAML representation of an environment. So it defines a set of services, um, where those services are, and configuration for each of those services. So charms expose relation data as well as configuration data for that stack. So I've just declared this. It's very quite, it's quite large, complex. I think it'd actually be better to show you guys on in a GUI instead. Let me pull that up. Oh, that's a good sign. Spelling. There we go. Yes, uh, it's a self signed cert. I trust myself on this little box here. And then, real quickly, let me get a password to log in. Oh, good, the password's easy. <laughs> Nobody saw that. <laughs> uh, so Juju, in addition to giving you a command line, as you've seen briefly here, um, things like running Juju status, uh, which gives me kind of a, an output in YAML of what my environment looks like. I have one machine that I bootstrapped earlier for sake of time. Um, I have a Juju GUI deployed to that environment. Um, and Juju GUI itself is a charm, and I'm now executing this set of services against that, which is OpenStack itself. So we should see in a few moments a bunch of lights start flickering on the front. Um, you can see the GUI starts being populated with the services I've told to deploy. Uh, this is things like Nova Compute, um, Nova Con Controller, Keystone, MySQL, um, Ceph, all those things that you need. Of course, if you've never worked with OpenStack, all that means nothing to you. But in a few moments, as we see this thing dancing around, I'm going to jump over to here to make this a little easier to understand. This is what OpenStack essentially will look like at the end of the day. Um, it's a lot of services. It's a lot of services doing a lot of complex things. It is essentially building a private cloud, much like you would use in Amazon, but for yourself on your own hardware. So you have things like compute resources, which is like EC2. You have things like uh, object stores, which is S3. You have things like RDBS, all those things that you model in a private, in a, in a public cloud can be modeled with OpenStack in a private cloud. Um, so what Juju does is each one of these boxes is a service essentially. Um, it is a, I'm sorry, it is a charm that encapsulates that. And with Juju, you can do things like connect this charm to the service, which has that protocol for communication between what this service is and what it needs to provide to the service. You can also scale pretty straightforwardly. So if I need additional keystones, which is the authentication method for OpenStack, I can just simply say, well, I need 12 units of these. Um, I can commit this transaction. A whole bunch of new units are going to pop up. And Juju will take care of that resource allocation problem. So it says I need 12 more units. 
I don't have any machines available in my pool, it'll contact the provider, whether it's Maz, whether it's an LXC container on your laptop, whether it's an Amazon instance in EC2, whatever it is, spin up the physical resources it needs to meet that con constraint requirement, put the code on there, re-execute all the events and replay essentially everything that's happened from the start of the deployment, including relations and everything else, uh, and then manage that within a pool of clusters. So while the box hasn't changed, we still only have one box. If we go to the machine view, we actually have a whole bunch of ton more Keystone machines, and now we're up to 30 machines in this environment. Um, so that's partially what Juju does, and that's how we use the model complexity. As you can see here, it takes a little longer when you're actually using real bare metal. Ah, let's go to Maz. Um, so we can see things went from ready to being deploying. So this means that Maz is taking care of the operating system provisioning. Um, Juju told Maz, I need these machines with this operating system on them. Maz has all of the resources required to fill that request and goes ahead and executes that. So uh, we have a VM that turned on. We have several physical machines that turned on. They're all allocated to me. So that's the whole, through the process of allocation to provisioning. Um, I could do terrible things as an admin, like turn stuff off randomly. Uh, Juju knows how to handle that as a response, as, whoa, this machine went away. What do you want me to do about that? Um, we could see from GG status output, it's gonna actually be kind of long, we'll pipe to less. Um, it now has an idea of what each of these machines is requested as. It lets you know where the instance lives in MAS. This could be a, an EC2 AMI, I'm not AMI, what's the instance ID? Whatever the launch instance IDs are called, I don't quite remember, sorry. Um, it's basic hardware characteristics. It's an AMD 64 machine with four cores and 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, it's also a physical machine, not a virtual one. This one here is virtual. Um, and then I can see uh, where those machines map to. So I can see that Solometer is being mapped to, um, well, that's a bad example. Let's go to Ceph. Ceph's being mapped to machine one, two, and three, and four. Uh, Juju also knows how to model density to an extent. So you can say, deploy this service as a LexC or KVM container on a physical machine. So if you don't want 30 physical machines or don't have 30 physical machines, you can use a pretty beefy machine to allocate and uh, confine resources in KVM or LexC. Um, and since these charms are written in any, any which way, you may find that some charms, and this is typically illuminated in the readme, uh, the way they're being deployed is using things like Docker containers and such. So uh, in addition to things like OpenStack, which are rather large, we also have things like the ability to model uh, Kubernetes in a scale-out fashion. So you can do Kubernetes deployed to bare metal the way you would on the Google Compute Engine, and you can scale each component, each component independently. Um, so Kubernetes is attached to a Docker base, which allows you to say, hey, add these containers to my environment. As you scale out Docker, uh, it also grows the knowledge of where these machines are in Flannel. Um, in addition to being registered in Flannel through etcd, it also has Kubernetes running on there as a, as a, as a kind of provisioning layer, an orchestration layer, and master then knows how to orchestrate and manage all of those sub-machines in there. So it's a little confusing to look at this from a top level down because basically what you have is you have Flannel, Docker living on top of Docker, and Kubernetes living on top of here. And every time you add a unit of Docker, those services grow with it. Um, and then we have etcd and Kubernetes masters as separate services on their own machines managing that workflow. Um, so that's an example. Another example of deployments, there are hundreds of different varying ways to deploy any service you'd like within Juju. Um, we have a lot of people, telcos especially, are now using this kind of stuff. Um, Deutsche Telekom is using Juju and Maz to deploy their OpenStack installs they use locally. Uh, and a, many other banks and telcos are doing the same as well. Uh, what we find especially exciting is that things that work on very small scale, one, ten machines, work very well as well at very large scale and large distributed systems. So Juju has the ability to model at the very lowest level to the very highest level and scale in between there. All right, let's go back over here. Um, yeah, services are still coming online. Uh, let's see, Maz is still the booting these up. So they're all pretty much marked as deployed. So the OS is there. It's been handed off to Juju now. Juju's doing its resource and provisioning and installing, excuse me, all the pieces it needs onto here. Um, yeah. So. That's essentially at a high level, Juju, Maz, how they relate to each other, how you can do very complex deployments distilled down into Juju. Um, 
It's great if you already have existing tools that you're using. If you wish to wrap those and be able to move them between clouds very quickly or other pieces of hardware very quickly, you can use Juju to model and wrap them quite efficiently and then deploy out. Um, I'm happy to dive into other examples and questions. I know we have a little bit of time left, so yeah. Sure. So the question is, is you have Foreman and Puppet working in your environment currently, and where does Juju fit into that picture? So Juju essentially becomes a replacement for Foreman at that point. Um, I don't know if we've wrapped Foreman. I don't think we have wrapped Foreman. This is Foreman, the tool used from the command line, not Foreman, the process manager. There's, maybe I'm thinking of another thing. Um, this is Foreman, the command line tool, correct? Like the... Um, Resource allocation tool, I don't know, the deployment tool, the deployment tool, right? Yeah. I maybe think of something slightly different. Um, really, the thing that you're most interested in is the puppet scripts, because they define the machine. Foreman does the string together of how those machines are all laid out. So that's what Juju would be doing, and Charms would be taking over that process. So if, if Foreman and Puppet work for you, this probably isn't the solution for you. Um, if you're having problems Moving past that, if you're, if you're having issues where you're fighting Foreman more often than not, then Juju may be a potential solution for you. There's, at the end of the day, it's always the right tool for the right job. So Foreman and Puppet are a pretty solid example of something that works pretty well together. There are a plethora of other tools that work very well together that solve a similar problem to this. Um, if you find that those are lacking, we have, we've essentially attacked the idea of orchestration from the top down. So. When we first designed the system, we said, how do we solve orchestration? That's the problem we solved, and implicitly we covered a lot of other topics underneath there, how to deploy machines, how to configure machines, um, and to make that easier so that we're not choosing a particular technology or locking anyone to a particular idea, we've opened up the spectrum of things you can wrap within a charm. We're just saying, Juju, is really this, the, Juju really wants to be the thing that orchestrates and scale your services. How you get the underlying machine to be up to, the, to par with the application deployed is up to you. It's, it's a double-edged sword from what we've understood because people who are very interested in charm say, well, just tell me how to get started. And we're like, well, anything you want. It's all up to you. Um, so if you have a working configuration management tool already and you're looking to add the ability or some agility on top of that to scale between different architectures, different operating systems, different providers and environments, Juju may be something that's interested to you. If what you have is working completely awesome and everything is automated in your ops, Juju probably isn't something you want to dive and spend time into looking into. Uh, but great question. I hope I've answered that satisfactorily for you guys. Um, yeah. Um, so um, when, for example, you're using Juju, um, Foreman, for example, has the smart proxies taking care of DNS, DHCP, whatever, um, when, for example, you're booting up a new operating system. So h how is uh, Juju doing that? So, so yeah, that's a great question. So Juju is delegating all of that work to whatever provisioning layer it's talking to. So if it's talking to Maz, Maz is handling the DNS, DHCP, and the image um, push out. If it's talking to Amazon, it's just simply requesting, uh, I need the official AMI for Ubuntu, or for Windows that has cloud in it enabled, or for CentOS with cloud in it enabled. Um, so it's using, it's leveraging more of the provider to handle that method for you, and it abstracts that away. Really all it cares about is I need a machine with this characteristics and these resources that I can SSH into. Uh, so that's how it's doing that. It's, that's where we kind of drew the line in, in the sand we did Juju. Is we don't want to do, we really just want to do whatever we, the bare minimum required to get to so we can start orchestrating. That's, that's the layer we've taken. Um, so any other questions? If not, I'd be happy if people are quest curious about services they want to see deployed, we can jump into the Charm School. We've got a lot of ISVs and vendors that have been charming their software, so it makes it very easy to deploy through Juju. Um, yes? Yes. Are, you, are we able to deploy to Power8? <laughs> yes, Juju can. Yes, yeah, so if you use Ubuntu as the base, which Ubuntu has support for Power8, both Open Power and Little Indian. Um, so if you're deploying with Ubuntu in that case, that, the operating system has to support that architecture before we can get there, but Ubuntu does in this case, so you can deploy a workload onto Power8 and ARM using virtually the same charm, um, unless 
the, really only re the only really constraint we've seen is that if you're using any Java app on Power8, you should really be using IBM's Java. It's optimized for Power8. But if you're deploying just a standard application that doesn't have any kind of special requirements for packages, it'll work on Power8 just like it works on ARM, just like it works on x86. And you can actually do benchmarking across the stack to see which architecture works best for you. We found Power8 to be quite fast, actually. Um, we're not doing the enablement for operating systems, other operating systems outside of Ubuntu. I mean, at the end of the day, we're canonical. We are Ubuntu, so that's, that's what we're most interested in. That's where we have the most expertise around. Um, but if CentOS were to grow support for Power8, and I'm sure the Open Power Foundation is doing a lot of things to make sure that operating systems do support those architectures, um, as, soon as, that, as soon as another operating system grows Power8 support, we will see uh, it work in Juju relatively straightforward without any changes. Uh, great question. Uh, any workloads anyone's curious in seeing? We can uh, watch grass grow by um, watching the GUI dance around and add stuff. So we see services are coming online. Ceph has got a couple of units that are online. The bar shows generally the health status. So I have two running units. They're good. They've come online. They're green. They've registered themselves. One pending or one installing unit. So it's still installing Ceph as itself. Um, other services are still likely coming online. It looks like Neutron gateways online, a couple others. I should have probably kicked this off at the beginning of my talk. That would have been much more interesting to poke around in this. Um, but at the end of the day, given about each teacher takes about 15 minutes. After about 15 minutes, you'll have a whole cloud. We can log into the OpenStack dashboard, launch instances, uh, do nested virtualization, all that crazy crap. Um, does anyone have anything else they're interested in seeing? Maybe how this models a certain deployment, a certain workflow, a certain topic. Um, feel free to let me know. We have a few more minutes, or quite a few more minutes. I May have talked a little too fast. Yes. Well, so that's a great question. So the question being, is there any good topics uh, or any good tutorials on how to set up a two-node MAS? I assume you want to try things like OpenStack and stuff. Or deploy and just deploying jet. You have two nodes. That's all you have. Um, you'll so yes. There are. There is a there is a guide. Right. So. The best way to set up a very limited MAS node, um, we actually, we've done this. I don't think we've published it. I've done it at least once. Yeah, I, I personally have used Intel Nux, the things that are in here to do this deployment. But we recently did, I recently did a deployment where I had a pretty beefy piece of hardware. I installed MAS in a Lexi container with a bridge to the parent. And then I had... KVM nodes turned on inside that parent that are using that bridge to do the communication. So we can do the same DHCP and DNS that you'd want to do through that bridge. Through Ma It's a very complicated setup, but I haven't published instructions on this, and I probably should. You can actually do MAS with just one node um, if you have the patience for it. Um, I don't have one, but that's a great follow-up. I'd be happy to write that up this evening and tomorrow and then publish it um, on my blog. MarcoCheffy.com. Um, so if you're interested, or at least find me afterwards. I'll give you my email address. Or rather, I guess I should just go to this final slide. Um, find me by those contact methods. If you have any questions in general, I'm happy to answer them. Juju, Maz, Ubuntu, not Ubuntu, questions about cats. I have a couple of answers about those. Interesting random factoids. If you're going to a trivia night, let me know. I'd be happy to fill you out with random trivial information. Um, does anyone have any additional questions? Um, we continue watching grass grow. We can deploy other things. I can break stuff. I'm pretty good at that as well. Um, it doesn't even have to be Juju related at this point. You can ask any questions. It's a free forum. We still have 20 more minutes to lunch, so we have time oh, for questions. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I, I got to talk a lot slower next time. This one here? Yes. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to talk about the hardware in it. So, 
I can also, I think, mention a general bar, ballpark price. So we don't actually sell this. We buy it from a manufacturer in the UK called Tranquil. We just buy it from them. This is stuff that we take along with us to uh, customer sites, conferences such as this one. Um, and it's great to show how Maz works and how Juju works on top of that, and how bare metal is story. If you can imagine everything we did on bare metal, we can do it on the clouds. Clouds, man. Um, it has a 10 Intel NUCs. There's one NUC that has two NICs. Um, it basically has an outside NIC, so I'm actually routing my laptop through the internal network. That's how I can connect to it so quickly. But there's another network that goes outside of it. So Maz, Maz really wants to use two NICs, one for the outside network, and then it controls everything else inside of its scope. You don't have to run it that way, but otherwise you won't get things like DHCP or DNS management. Uh, you just do basic dumb metal management. Um, the, the node zero, the very first one here, the, the one light in the front here, somewhere in there, um, it has a two terabyte hard drive on it that has the entire Ubuntu archive mirrored on it so we can get really fast local offline deployments. Um, outside of that, each one of the NUCs has, I don't know, like a whole bunch of disk. That's the technical term. Um, I don't know why I didn't gather that. That would have been really cool to show. It's like, like 250, 260 gigs of disk. Um, they all have one NIC. Later versions have two NICs, so you can actually do very complex network models and bonded NICs and virtual software-defined networks and all this fun stuff that people do these days in data centers. Um, that's essentially it. It uses Intel's AMT protocol to communicate with it. It's like IPMI, but Intel-specific. It only is on one version of the NUCs. Um, it also has one power supply and only one fan in the back for the power supply. All the NUCs are actually passively cooled by these heat sinks on the side. Um, so it's very quiet, it's very power efficient. Um, there aren't many moving parts, but I still find ways to break it. Um, so these are these, they're, they're from Tranquil. They're like, they're over 10,000 euro uh, box. This is not something you'd wanna buy and put in your data center. It's, it's, all, uh, it's all commodity, hardware you can pick up at the store. It's just in a very nice, presentable, easily travelable case. Uh, it's quite nicely branded as well. Um, so that's the orange box, more or less. Um, but it is very cool. It's, it's very fun to have at conferences. Uh, it's a very interesting piece of hardware. Um, yeah. So, uh, great question. We have oh, like 15 more minutes. <laughs> How's everyone doing at the conference so far? Good conference so far? Yeah, I know it's, I know it's still first day. I know you guys got to this talk and you were like, whoa, this guy, wow, Juju. Okay, any more questions or shall we end it at this time <laughs> and uh, simply leave it here until, the, until uh, the next track continues so you can take an, another free unit. Would that suit you? Okay, no negative feedback, so I guess that's it. So, thank you very much for thank your you. time. Thank you guys. <laughs>